Today we celebrate the holiest of days in Christianity. This is a holy day. On the Christian calendar, Resurrection Sunday changed the world. They're talking about Jesus and they're asking him, haven't you heard about this? And Jesus just plays along. You know, I mean, it's him they're talking about. And he said, tell, tell me about this. And they encountered something they didn't really expect to encounter. They encountered someone. Welcome church. He is risen. We're so glad that you're with us today, chosen to worship today on this most holy day of the Christian faith. We're just honored that you're here, but we are also privileged, every one of us, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, what a privilege to worship today and to recognize and to celebrate a risen King. It's awesome. Today is the day that we celebrate the victory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Praise His name. We're going to move right into the scripture. I would like you to turn, if you would, to Luke, the 24th chapter. We're going to be focusing upon an account and upon a story of one of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ. The title of the message today is The Encounter. The Encounter. I've subtitled it, A Personal Encounter with the Resurrected Christ. And by the way, while you're looking for that scripture, Luke 24, and we're going to begin reading a little further back on, with verse 9. We're going to interrupt the, one of the accounts of the visit to the tomb on this resurrection day. And verse 9 as we begin that, I want to thank all of you that have sent cards uh, recently to us, to Pam, and to me. Uh, we just want to take this opportunity to thank you. Very kind of you. And if you sent a card, please consider yourself thanked. Uh, we're just so grateful that you remember us and we're humbled that you do so. So we're interrupting this account on this momentous day over 2,000 years ago when they have gone to the tomb, the ladies have gone to the tomb to post-death do that which was supposed to, be, to have been done immediately after death, but they had to wait because of the Sabbath. And so they go the next day, which is the first day of the week. They take with them the ingredients, they take with them that which would have helped to, by Jewish custom to preserve the body, to show proper reverence, for the body, according to custom. And of course, we know, those of you that are familiar with the scripture know that when they got to the gravesite, to the tomb location, uh, it was quite different. And they encountered something they didn't really expect to encounter. They encountered someone they didn't expect to encounter. So let's begin with verse 9 of the 24th chapter of Luke. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven, and to all the others. Now Judas has already hung himself because of his betrayal. And it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. By the way, the song, I've Just Seen Jesus, those of you that know the Bible know that that is written, those words were written from the perspective of Mary, who we will talk about later in the message today, who went to the tomb and when she was there, she encountered Christ. And she came back and told the disciples. But it says in verse 11, now think of this. These are the individuals, these are the people that have been hand-selected by Christ. They've been hand-selected by Jesus. They have been with him. They've lived with him. They've heard him teach. They have literally rubbed shoulders with him. They've been closer to him than anyone else on earth. And they are now hidden for fear of the government. They saw their Lord, they saw Jesus brutally, brutally without any pity whatsoever, tortured and, and killed, crucified, executed. And now they, they believe, and perhaps rightfully so, that the government's looking for them. So they've hidden. But the, but the ladies, God bless them. God bless the ladies of the church and the ladies down through the centuries 
who have kept the church stable. Amen. But the ladies, the ladies have gone to the tomb. So they come back. They're excited. They come back. They're excited beyond belief. And they come back and they tell the disciples. They tell them what they saw, what they experienced. What was the reaction of Peter and James and John and these disciples, these men who Jesus had trusted? What was their reaction? It says in verse 11, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, that same day, verse 13, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. They were depressed, they were discouraged. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. I think this is just so, I, I really love this. I, there's something about this that Jesus, they're talking about Jesus. And they're asking him, haven't you heard about this? And Jesus just plays along. You know, I mean, it's him they're talking about. And he said, tell, tell me about this. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to, the, to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ, that is the Messiah, have to suffer these things and then enter his glory and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scripture concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked to us on the road and opened the scripture to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke bread. I mean, what, what an amazing story, what an amazing and incredible privilege that these men experienced a personal encounter with Christ. As I said earlier, today we celebrate the holiest of days in Christianity. This is a holy day. And on the Christian calendar, Resurrection Sunday changed the world. It changed the calendar. Your birth date is based upon the birth of Christ, which would have never been recognized nor noted had he not risen from the grave. It is right for us to celebrate. And the resurrection of Christ has been a dividing line, has been a subject of division ever since it happened. Christ was a personality of controversy. Christ himself said that I did not come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. What did he mean by that? He didn't mean that he came to start wars. He, he meant that he came with a sword that would neatly divide those who believed and did not believe and those who would even actively oppose. Unfortunately, down through the years, we have 
witness the increased and purposeful secularization of Christian holy days. And in fact, we, we now call them holidays. Holidays, not holy days. And I would remind you that holidays can be determined and set by men. But holy days are determined by God. But we've seen this increased effort down through the ages to secularize that which Christianity holds dear. Uh, we, we see Santa Claus emphasized and Frosty the Snowman and, and all of that, anything, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, more than the Christ in the manger. And with Easter, we see the bunny rabbits. My neighbors have on our street, they have bunny rabbits in their front yard. Bunny rabbits and eggs and everything else but, but that cross and but that empty tomb. We even have a president who uh, disallowed any religious symbols at the Easter egg roll and hunt at the White House. For the first time, any president has ever done that. So the secularization of the holidays, the holy days, is not limited, unfortunately, though, just to those specific days, but it has permeated the whole of Western society. And you hear me refer to that from time to time, but it isn't something new that individuals lack faith in Christ. It has happened ever since the beginning. It happened when he was here on earth. But perhaps what is new is that it seems to have dropped to an all-time low in our own nation in the United States of America. Uh, in an interview just, just two weeks ago, in March, I listened to an interview of George Gallup, excuse me, George Barna, who was a very um, admired and respected pollster in the United States, been doing it for decades, and he shared some of the results from his recent polls. He said that in their recent polling in the United States of America, they found that 66% of the adults classify themselves as Christian. And yet when questioned, about their lifestyle and about their biblical world view, he found that only 3% of the 66% were really, would really be considered a disciple and follower of Jesus. By generation, he also discovered some shocking statistics. The baby, the baby boomers, which of which I'm a part of the baby boomer generation, the baby boomers, 8%. Only 8% have a biblical worldview. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that they say that their lifestyle and their choices in life are determined and guided by the principles of the Bible. Only 8% in the United States of baby boomers, my age, have a biblical worldview. Now, they may give some kind of a surface answer that, yes, I'm a Christian, because they think that's what you do. Okay, one time I went to a church. I guess if I have to choose a religion, I guess I'm going to choose Christianity. And so they choose Christianity. But in reality, their lives are, do not reflect that faith at all. Only 3%, baby boomers, excuse me, 8%. Gen X generation, 5%. Millennials, 4%. The youngest of our generations, around 2%, and the 8 to 12-year-olds that they surveyed, 1%. 1% of the 8 to 12. You say, well, that's pretty young. But George Barna has found that the average age by which an individual adopts a philosophy and lifestyle in regards to their faith in Christ is by the age of 13. And so these are alarming statistics. And so the first question that we would ask is, how did it get to this? How did we come to this where we are losing whole generations? And we're not just barely losing them. We are losing, I mean, 98% of them, 99% of them do not believe in Christ. They don't believe what I'm preaching today. And they don't believe perhaps what you would. How, how did that happen? Well, it happened this way. Only 2% of the parents of children under the age of 13. George Barner found after interviewing thousands of people across the spectrum in the United States, only 2% of the parents raising children under the age of 13 have a biblical worldview. But let me alarm you even further. Only 12%, they discovered, of the youth pastors and of the children pastors and leaders in our churches have a biblical worldview. In other words, seven out of eight of the youth pastors in evangelical churches in the United States of America qualify as a real biblical believing Christian. And they're teaching your children. They're teaching our children. 
When Americans were questioned on the greatest influencers in their lives, that which influences their lifestyle and their daily living, the ch local church was not in the top 20 of their list of influencers in their lives. In other words, Christianity is dissolving into invisibility right in front of our eyes. The church is no longer of any impact in the United States, at least in the culture itself. But it, it, it doesn't stop there. But I, I'm, I'm leading somewhere, it doesn't stop there. It isn't just that we have uh, a society that just simply doesn't believe, but is benign towards Christianity. What we're finding is that we have a society that has become increasingly antagonistic and angry towards Christianity and is on the attack. And that is something that we have not seen since biblical days, certainly not in the United States of America. You may have heard recently that Glenrock, New Jersey, Councilwoman Paula Gilligan is facing pressure to resign after she mocked Easter online with drag and abortion references. And it's so obscene that I won't read her quote to you. And then Fairfax County, Virginia board voted nine to zero to declare transgender day of visibility purposely on Easter Sunday. And following their action, as many of you may have heard, our president and the White House declared Easter Sunday Transgender Day of Visibility. So the White House has declared today, you thought it was Easter, it really isn't Easter, it really isn't Resurrection Sunday, it's Transgender Day of Visibility. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have never come to a point in our society where there's been such an aggressive onslaught against the principles of Christianity. And yet I would remind you that there are some precepts set in order, and, and we're going to go somewhere here very quickly, but there are some principles that you need to remember and you need to recognize. And that is this. As already had been mentioned by J.W. prior to his prayer, no matter what they do, no matter how obscene, no matter how they try to desecrate this day, no matter what they do to try to deface what you and I hold dear as Christians, they will never ever change the fact that the tomb is empty and Christ is risen. And the other thing that America, I'm afraid, is about to find out if we continue on this course is that God, the Bible says God is not mocked. I didn't say that. Don't kill the messenger. The Bible says that. The Bible says God will not be mocked and they're mocking God and they're mocking his son. And God will not be mocked. So there's a day coming. I don't know how. I don't know what. But if we continue in this course, God is not going to allow it to happen. So this, this level of unbelief, this level of antagonism in the church has led us. And by the way, the church is filled with individuals that are nice people. Uh, but one of the other things that's decreasing, of course, obviously, is that people that believe actually that Christ rose from the dead. The church is filled in the United States with nice people who believe Jesus was a good teacher, good man, but they do not believe Christ rose from the dead. That's secular humanism. Humanism, secular humanism is, is the belief that, that nature is a closed system. What do I mean by that? Nature is a closed system. Everything you see, everything you feel, everything you can touch, everything you can observe, that's all there is. And so anything outside of that closed system of nature is not held to be accurate or, or even in existence by secular humanists. Let's put that into everyday term. It means there's no such thing as supernatural. Nothing supernatural is reality. And so secular humanists could believe that Jesus was a, a very nice man, a good historical figure, perhaps did some good things, but he did not rise from the dead. And our church is literally infiltrated with individuals who believe that. But the, the deeper question is this, and, I, and again, I'm going someplace. How did the church get to this place? The church, the, the, really the fault lies at the feet of the church. The church is the one who is to share the light. The church is the one who's to be the salt of the earth. We are the preservative, the Bible says, of a decaying earth, of, a, of decaying societies. Christ gave the church to the world so that the world could be a, a preserver of that which is right and good and just and holy. How did we get to this place? Well, all you need to arrive at a place like this is for a couple generations of pastors and preachers to not 
live up to that which God has called them to do. All you need is a couple of generations of preachers who refuse. They're more afraid of the people and the people in their church and of their board and of the individuals that, that are members than they are of God. And those preachers, if they fail to preach the Bible in all of its strength because they're afraid they're going to offend someone and they don't want to hurt anybody and they have good hearts, what happens is they preach a diluted message. And by preaching a diluted message, we do our people no favors whatsoever. The only way that there is power enough in the Word and in the Gospel to transform your life by the power of heaven is when the Word of God and the Gospel is pre presented in full strength. That's the only way that God is able to change your life. So what we have then is we have a couple of generations of churchgoers who have never experienced a personal encounter with the risen Christ. What we read of and what we read in the New Testament are many encounters, one after another, after another, after another, like the men on the road to Emmaus, who encountered, had a personal life-changing encounter with the risen Christ. We find that the disciples did. In fact, even later on in Luke, the 24th chapter, we find that they had this encounter. We also see that Mary had an encounter with Christ at the tomb. The two men on the way to Emmaus had an encounter with Christ. And I would submit to you that these aren't encounters that it just would have really been, you know, we may say, wouldn't it have been cool for Jesus to do that? Yes, it would have. But I submit to you that for you and I to truly follow Christ today, we have to have experienced a personal encounter, post-resurrection encounter with Christ. Now, the question then is this. If I submit to you, if I say, you say, okay, preacher, you're saying I have to somehow meet personally Jesus Christ. Now, how in the world does that happen? How does it take place? If we all have to have a personal encounter with the post-resurrected Christ, just as real, maybe not visible, but just as real as these disciples did, if Christ is still encountering individuals here on earth, and he is, if he is, then there, are, are there any common threads? Are there any characteristics? Are there any consistent hallmarks? Are there any traits of these encounters? Are there any consistent traits? How do we know what is there about an encounter with Christ? So I want to launch into that here very quickly because I've discovered in the Bible, as I've discovered the encounters Christ had with the disciples before he ascended and the encounters that he has had in history with individuals down through the ages the witness and the testimony of people who have had a post-resurrection encounter with Christ, there are some common characteristics. This is not an exhaustive list, but I can tell you there are at least three common characteristics that I see as I study the scriptures. Number one, the number one characteristic of individuals that have encountered the, the post-resurrected Christ in a very life-changing encounter. Number one, it is outside of our own initiative. One of the things I discovered is that you and I in our own efforts and circumstances cannot produce a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. You can't produce it. I can't produce it. It's outside of our power. Because every encounter that I've studied and every encounter of people that I read their testimonies and even in my own life, that encounter is precipitated, that means initiated, by God. God is the one who initiates it. Remember now, it said in verse 15 of the scripture we read, it says that they were walking on the road to Emmaus and it says in verse 15, Jesus drew near and went with them. They didn't initiate this conversation. They didn't initiate this encounter. When Mary was at the tomb, she went to the tomb, but she didn't initiate the encounter with Christ. 
When, the, when Jesus appeared to the disciples, they didn't initiate, they had no power to make Jesus appear. All of these encounters, all of these close encounters with the risen Christ, the Son of the living God, happened because Jesus wanted them to happen. It happened because God initiated it. So it stands to reason that even we today cannot somehow start or precipitate or set up an encounter with Jesus Christ. We can't initiate it through our own position, whether that be secular or religious. In fact, remember the disciples were as close as anyone to him and they didn't recognize him. They rubbed shoulders with him. As I said earlier, Mary Magdalene was standing right next to him in the garden outside the tomb, talking to him in John the 20th chapter, verse 14, and she didn't recognize him. You can be close to Jesus. We can be raised in the church. We can grow up listening to the stories. We can go every Sunday. We can know the Bible. We can be catechized. We can be so close that we rub shoulders with Jesus, so to speak, and with the kingdom every week and never ever have a personal encounter with the risen Christ. We can even be a minister. We can go to seminary. We can study the Bible in the Greek. There are professors in liberal theology classes that, that know the Bible and study it in the Greek and can teach it in a very deep fashion, incredible minds, and they've never had a personal encounter with the risen Christ. Why is that? Because you and I cannot initiate it on our own. It's outside of our own power. Cannot be initiated through our intellect. Cannot be initiated through our knowledge. We can arrive at an understanding, but we can never have a genuine encounter with Christ within our own power. The Bible says in John 6, no one, Jesus said this, listen to this, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. In other words, you and I, even gathered here today, even in the sanctuary, out here in the cars, may have good intentions, may have made efforts to get here, may have done other things and had to sacrifice to get here. You may have a, a genuine working knowledge of the Bible. You may have been dedicated, catechized, but you cannot force yourself or force God to give you an encounter with the risen Christ. It is outside of your power. And it isn't that we don't try to reason. Reason is part of, reason is part of this. God doesn't expect us to lay down reason. People say Christianity and faith, faith in Christ is outside of reason. No, it is not. It is more than reason, but it's not less than reason. It is more than reason, but not less than reason. In fact, once you truly see, it is the most logical thing you have ever encountered in your life. And so we don't intellectually, can't be initiated by our generosity or our works. We can't work our way into an encounter with Christ. It is an extreme privilege for these two men to be walking on the way to Emmaus and for Jesus to just come up alongside of them was totally outside of their power. For Mary to be approximated near the tomb and Jesus then finally to reveal himself to her was totally outside of her power. For you and I to have a life-changing, life-changing, altering encounter with the risen Christ is totally outside of our power and we can't work our way into it. In fact, Ephesians, the second chapter, it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Nobody can work. Their way. Nobody's going to stand before God on the judgment day and say, I did this and I did that. And don't you remember I tossed that into the offering play? Don't you remember I did this on the church work day? Nobody can work their way in. Works follow, but works cannot precipitate an encounter with Christ. Every post-resurrection encounter we see recorded in the Bible was initiated by Jesus. Let me say that again. Every post-resurrection encounter that we see recorded in the Bible was initiated, was started by Jesus as it has been down through the ages right up to this moment. Every encounter every human being has ever had 
with the living Christ has been initiated by Him for that person. They didn't have the power to do it. That's why it is so important that if you sense, you say, how do you know? You know. God knows how to speak to you. He speaks to you down in your heart. He goes past your head, down into who you are, your soul, our souls. He created us. He speaks deeper than any other power, than any other communicator that we know. God speaks in a place that, that no one else can reach. And when God speaks to us, it may not be an audible voice, but when you know that God is speaking to you, and quite often you become uncomfortable because all of a sudden you're aware that the kingdom of heaven is near. You don't know how to describe it, but you're like, and, and sometimes, many times, some people want to get out of there. They say, this is getting too close. I don't like this. This, this is getting really, that is a sign that Jesus is drawing near to you. That is a sign that God through His Word is coming close to you. That there's an initiation of encounter taking place. And, and we should never ignore that. The Bible warns us, it says, if you hear Him, if you hear His voice today, it says, don't harden your hearts in Hebrews 3.15. That's why it is written today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart. Why? I remember years ago, as I traveled, as we traveled, as conference speakers and, 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 uh, and evangelists, as it was called, special speakers, across the eastern half of the United States, I remember that we were in Cambridge, Ohio, right here in Ohio. And we were at a friend's church. The pastor had called me there, and, and I was preaching. And, and back in those days, they started Wednesday and preached through Sunday morning and Sunday night. And then I would go to another, Pam and I and our daughter would go to another church. And, and, I, and I have a ledger, and I wrote in that ledger, uh, sometimes I would write notes, Cambridge, Ohio, this date, this is what I preached. And I would write in there sometimes notes. And I noticed, I looked it up last night, I wrote very hard, very hard to preach. Tremendous resistance. And it was really hard for me to speak. And, but I would plow my way through. But then towards the end, it said Breakthrough. And I remember we had some wonderful, wonderful breakthroughs, people coming to Christ. Well, we went back, we were traveling through that area, and Pastor Joe Pierce and his wife were friends of ours, and so we stopped there and on a Wednesday night, just a few weeks later, and what we found out was that there was a man there on that Sunday morning who had come because his wife had twisted his arm to come. Come hear this preacher. And so he came. I remember he was sitting towards the back. And there was a good crowd there that morning, and I gave an invitation for people to accept Christ. And he stepped out, and he came forward, and he prayed. And I noticed that, that when this man walked down the aisle, there was repercussions throughout the church. I noticed people reacting. I noticed women began to cry. I noticed that men immediately got out of their seats and came down to stand with this man and to be with him. And I found out his story, and they told me later that he once had attended church weekly and had been involved in the church. And, but he told God, God began to put him under conviction to come to Christ and to give his heart to him. Jesus began to encounter him. And he told, he hardened his heart. And in his heart, he told God, I don't want to hear you. And from that point forward, for I don't know how many years, I think it was 12 years, he had attended church and he had never, ever again felt any compulsion to give his heart to Christ. He was as dead as a doornail inside of his heart. And it scared him. And he got to the point where this man began to pray that God would speak to him. And, and it was still silence. Week after week, month after month. And so he quit coming to church until that Sunday morning when they invited him and he came to church. And as he was standing there, the reason he stepped out so quickly and almost ran down the altar to the front of the church was because he said, for the first time in 12 years, I felt God's voice. I felt God drawing me. And guess what? A few weeks later, he died. Just before he died. He gave his heart. Listen, the Bible says, don't harden your heart. 
Because this isn't initiated by a preacher. This isn't initiated by religion. This isn't initiated by the church. This isn't re- initiated by, by some religious fanatic. If you have an encounter, if Christ draws near and you begin to get it and you begin to understand it and you begin to see it and you begin to feel His love drawing you and His love pulling on you, the Bible says don't harden your heart because it's all initiated by Him and you don't want to take it for granted. It's only initiated by him. Secondly, it's undeniable in comprehension. The second thing I noticed was that the millions of people, including those in the Bible, knew that they had met the Christ. They knew that they had encountered Christ. They knew they had come into contact with the Christ. Nobody could talk them out of it. They they knew in the Bible, of course, it was very dramatic. It's also very dramatic sometimes in life. But they knew that they had encountered the Christ. It's the same today. They're consistent today. If Christ encounters you, if you encounter Christ, you will know it. There will will be no way we'll stand before God someday and say, well, I never knew. Because God knows if you know. Jesus knows if he visited you. He knows if he has encountered you. And God is faithful. The Bible says God's not willing that any should perish, but that everybody would come to repentance. In other words, that everyone would would encounter his son and receive salvation. That's what's going on. That's, That's the goal. That's my goal. My goal is to preach in such a way that I pave the way with the word and set the stage so that Jesus can come and encounter you. So that you have an encounter, not just with a drive-in theater, not just with inside worship at church at the center. You have an encounter with the living Christ. You forget that there's a man standing in front of you because something strange is happening in your heart. That's my goal. Get your eyes off of me and to get your eyes on Christ and for you to meet him, a personal encounter. And when you do, you will know it. It will be based upon the Bible And it will leave you with a burning heart. That's what they said. What must have it been like to hear Jesus talk? I mean, they described it as if their hearts were on fire. They described it like, they both said, were not our hearts on fire? They must have looked at each other and said, wow. When he was opening the scriptures, something began to happen inside of me. That is a sign that you are encountering the Christ. When the words of the Bible, when the words that are being given, when somebody testifies to you, however you encounter the word, if all of a sudden there begins to something happen inside of you and something begin to, that is a sign of a burning heart. And you are encountering the Christ. And then the, then the other characteristic is open eyes. When we encounter the Christ, their eyes were open. They said our eyes were open. That's what happens when the power of the Holy Spirit is working through the Bible. Your eyes are open. You may not like what you see, but all of a sudden you begin to comprehend. It's like blinders are taken off of your eyes. It's like all of a sudden you see. It's it's an amazing thing. I had it happen to me. I had it happen when I was a little boy. And I can tell you, all those years ago, I can tell you what it it was like. I can tell you that as a little boy, and I backslid after that, I I didn't want to follow Christ. I rebelled. But I can tell you, I remember the Sunday that Jesus Christ came to me, a little boy. I I wouldn't have said it that way, but I became aware that I needed a Savior. And I began to cry as a little boy. I began to cry. My, my parents were in the choir and, and I was over in the overflow area by myself and, and I began to cry. I became convicted of my sin. And a little boy stepped out by himself and went to the altar and knelt down and prayed. Why did I do that? I did that because the living Christ, the post-resurrected Jesus, came to me and made himself known to me and I recognized I need a Savior. It opened my eyes. It opened my eyes. They've been open ever since because he opened them. Now remember, if Christ doesn't open your eyes, you will be like Mary. Mary talked to Jesus at the tomb. She talked with him at the tomb, and the Bible says she thought he was the gardener. 
You study it. He, she thought he was the gardener. Let's put that in common terms. If Jesus doesn't come to you by his spirit, you can hear all about Jesus. You can hear the stories. You can hear all, you can know the Bible stories, but it will have no effect on you. It'll be like a rubber ball bouncing off of this concrete floor. It will make no impression on you because you will, Jesus will be like a gardener to you. He'll be a common man if he doesn't come to you. But if he initiates an encounter with you, you'll know he's just not a man. Lastly, it is universal in transformation. Let's go back to our story for a moment. In the 33rd verse, it says, after their eyes were opened, after their hearts were burning, and their eyes were opened, and they realized that they had had an encounter with the resurrected Christ, it transformed them. One of the indications of that, look at verse 33. It says, so they rose up that very hour. They rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. Now remember, they were spending the night with Jesus. Remember, it's nighttime. They've already found a place to stay. They've, already, they've eaten. Jesus had broken bread with them. And instead of staying there all night, this encounter with the resurrected Christ so impacted them that they got their things ready and they turned around and launched out at night and walked seven miles back to Jerusalem. You say, what are you talking about? They did a 180. They were headed one direction, and after encountering the risen Christ and Him opening their eyes, they turned 180 degrees and headed the opposite direction. Ladies and gentlemen, when you have an encounter with the risen Christ, and He opens your eyes, and you accept Him, and you invite Him into your heart, I'm going to tell you, you are going to have a changed life. One of the indications is that your life changes when you've met the Christ. No one can meet the living Christ resurrected from the dead and accept him and have their eyes open without their lives changing. Amen. I wish we had more time, but notice it doesn't say that they didn't stub their toe. It never says anywhere they didn't stub their toe on the way back to Jerusalem. Nowhere in the Bible does it say they didn't trip on their way back to Jerusalem. What it says is, they changed direction and headed another way. God is not looking for, Jesus is not looking for per perfection of performance. He's looking for a changed heart where you say, I may not be perfect, I may make mistakes, I may fall, but I'm headed a different direction because I've encountered the Christ and I've given myself to Him. He's not looking for perfection. He's looking for a response to his reaching love. If Christ makes the initiation to reach to you and he takes that effort, he's watching to see what will be your response to that. It's not perfection. It's not that all of a sudden you're canonized. It, it is that you have become a, a follower of Christ. And your life has changed. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creature. They're a new creation. The old has gone. The new is here. Well, the initiation of a post-resurrection encounter, Jesus waits on our response. He waits on us. He's still initiating responses. It has been my sincere prayer last night and this morning is that God would help me, that Jesus would help me to present Him in such a wonderful, attractive, powerful way that it would be anointed by His Holy Spirit, that God would take my words and that he, the words of a man, and he would transform them miraculously into heart language that would somehow reach into the cars and reach into the sanctuary, into hearts, that people today, that you right now 
would experience an amazing, supernatural encounter with the risen Christ. We're going to pray in a moment. I'm going to give you an opportunity. There was a song that was written years ago that we sing many times on Easter Sunday. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is risen. I know that He is risen. Whatever men may say, whatever mocking, whatever they do, I know He is risen. Whatever men may say, I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. And it goes on to say, you ask me how I know He lives He lives within my heart. He's in me. The risen Christ is encountering people all over this world right now. And what they do with Him determines will they invite Him in to their heart and have that same testimony. So that when someone says, Christ is risen, they can return the answer in sincerity and say, He is risen indeed. How do you know? How do you know? I know that I know that I know that I know. Nobody's going to talk me out of it. (laughs) No, they say, well, you're brainwashed. No, I'm filled with Jesus inside. I know He's alive. And you're not going to vote it in and you're not going to vote it out. Do you know the risen Christ? Have you had an encounter with Him? We're going to pray. We're going to pray inside. We want you to stand if you would. It's a holy moment. I love the way Jesus encounters people. I love it. He comes to children. He came to me so gentle when I was a little boy. Comes to grown men. He knows how to talk to you. Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that what we talked about today isn't just fiction. It's just not the creative over-imagination of some individual that has somehow survived down through the ages. We have account after account after account. I have a count in my life. I have a count in my family's life where you have Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, has changed lives that no one else could change. Has worked miracles, has answered prayers. Jesus is alive and well. I pray right now for every person within the listening of my voice, for those that may be listening on YouTube. I pray right now that in an amazing way, as only you can do it, I I can't explain it, but that you will initiate right now an encounter with them. Oh, there's probably arguments going on in their head. This is just, don't pay any attention to this. There there may be some screaming going on in their mind, in their heart. Don't, no, this is just fake. Don't listen to it. But they know that something is happening. It's you, Jesus. It's you, Jesus. You're encountering them. You're meeting them. You're coming to them. They're having an encounter with the post-risen Christ. Now, I pray right now that they will do What is our part to do? That they will welcome you as Savior and Lord. That they will say, yes, Jesus, I hear your voice. It's not audible, but I know you're speaking to me. And right now, I want you to know that I place my faith in you. All of my faith. I'm making a life-changing decision right now. All of my faith I'm placing in you. I don't understand everything, but I know that I'm encountering the Christ. You're alive, and I ask you to save me. I ask you to forgive me. That's why you died on the cross. I ask you to forgive me for my sin and to to make me, to help me to be born again into your kingdom. And I pray that you'll come to live in my heart and that I will make you Lord of my life. 
And I'm going to head the direction you want me to head. And I'm going to live a life that is beyond my own comprehension, a blessing beyond my own understanding. For you, O oh God, have come to give life and life more abundant, Jesus, you said. I pray this unashamedly. Today is my day. I've encountered the Christ. I give my heart to Him. I mark this day as a life-changing day in my life, and I pray it unashamedly in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, and if you've never accepted Christ, if you've never prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask us to hold the cars in this holy moment. I'm going to ask you to step outside of your car. You say, well, that's not really easy. Well, Christianity isn't easy, but He's with us. It's life-changing. And you'll join, a, you'll join a large millions of people that have made that decision. But you're going to step out of your car. He died naked for you in front of thousands of people. And you're going to step out of your car and you're going to say, this is, I prayed it. I prayed it. I prayed it today. Step out. Yes, I see. Thank you. Inside, I'd invite you to go down front. You say, boy, that's, <laughs> that's pretty scary. I know I did it. But if you'll do that, Christ, that's it. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. What a life-changing moment. What, what in a wonderful, I encountered the living Christ. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? Thank you, Jesus, for these. Oh, we're so happy. We're so thrilled. <laughs> Thank you for these that have said, yes, I invited Christ in. I sensed his presence. I'm going to live for him with his help to the best of my ability. I'm not perfect, but I'm going to live for him and I receive his forgiveness. Jesus, seal this in their heart. We thank you. We praise you. We thank you for them. We thank you for your love for them. They have met the post-resurrected Christ. We just thank you for them. We encourage them, Jesus. And we pray this all in your name. Amen. Can you give them an applause and can you blow your horn? Hallelujah. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. You may get back in your cars. We're just so grateful. If you did, and, and I can see you, but I don't know who you are. If you want to let us know, even if it's rolling down your window and saying I'm one of them, and if, you, if we could somehow help you you give us any contact information. We're not going to badge you. I'm not going to show up at your house. And, and, uh, but, but we would love to get some materials into your hands. We'd love to help you in this journey because you have, been, you have started the most exciting journey of your life. He is risen. He is risen indeed. God bless you. Have a marvelous day.